And we're live. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Rira, and on behalf of Roman's Bookstore, I'd like to welcome you all to our presentation of Separated Inside an American Tragedy with Jacob so Soberoff and Ahilan Arulanantham. Uh, before we begin, I do have some quick guidelines. Um, if you would like to purchase a copy of tonight's uh, featured book, you can click on the green purchase button directly below the viewer screen. We do have signed copies available while supplies last. So if you would like a signed copy, please make a note in the comment section when you are finishing your purchase on our website. And also, this event includes an audience Q&A. To ask a question, just use the Ask a Question button at the very bottom of the screen. You can also vote for any questions you find interesting, and they'll make their way to the top of the list. And with that out of the way, let me introduce our guests for tonight. Jacob Soboroff is a correspondent for NBC News and MSNBC. For his reporting on the child separation policy, he received the 2019 Walter Cronkite Award for Individual Achievement by a National Journalist and the 2019 Hillman Prize for Broadcast Journalism. He has appeared on Today, Morning Joe, The Rachel Maddow Show, and many more shows. <laughs> he <laughs> he co-presented with Katie Turr the four-part event docu docuseries, American Swamp on MSNBC. Joining him tonight is Ahilan Arulanatham, Senior Counsel at the ACLU of Southern California. During his 16-year tenure at ACLU, he has successfully litigated several landmark cases, including Nadaraja versus Gonzalez, the first Ninth Circuit case establishing limits on the government's power to detain immigrants as national security threats. And I'm going to pass the screen over to our guests and enjoy the talk, everyone. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, so, super cool uh, opportunity to talk to Jacob here and very much uh, grateful that you were able to make it. We almost did this last time and then had a- That's my bad, uh, I, should, I gotta admit that right off the top. So sorry about that. Well, sort of your bad, sort of the bad of the really atrocious people doing really awful things to people in Georgia too, which maybe we'll get to Fair at enough. some point later yeah. on. Um, but let's start, I mean, I'm sure some of the people here have read the book. I read it, found it fascinating and really important. Thank but you. for many of the people who wouldn't, do you want to just give us a short summary of sort of the key essential points and the arguments you're making and stuff? Sure, sure. And <clears throat> excuse me, I just want to say it's really cool to be here with you as well. It's not often, I'm just going to take a sip of water. You saw me scarf my dinner before we started. And, and really well done. Thank you. <laughs> excuse me. It's not often. Um, uh, that I get to have a conversation like this with someone who knows these issues, um, you know, really literally inside and out. So, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a it's a it's a pleasure and an honor to do this with you tonight. So thank you. <clears throat> so, um, what's the story? In 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 2018, obviously the Trump administration engaged in the systematic um, separation of thousands of migrant children at the border. What we now know, um, Positions for Human Rights, the Nobel Peace Prize winning organization. Um, described as torture, meeting the UN's definition of torture, uh, the, the then president of American Academy of Pediatrics said it was government sanctioned child abuse. Um, and this was a policy that was a long time in the making. Um, and we can get into, you know, ultimately how it came to pass. Um, but it, fr quite frankly, you know, I ended up in the middle of it by being there in the two facilities that were really the epicenter of the policy. One was uh, the McAllen Border Patrol Central Processing Station uh, that they call Ursula, where um, th the world saw on Father's Day 2018, um, hundreds of separated children, you know, on those concrete floors um, under mylar blankets, literally supervised by security contractors in a watchtower. And that was, um, you know, I almost repeat it robotically at this point, but to, it, it makes me sick every time yeah. I, I think about what I saw with my own eyes. Um, yeah. And just a couple of days before that, I had been inside uh, basically the main feeder shelter for that, um, where the Border Patrol had was feeding the children that were coming out of there. It was the um, Casa Padre shelter. Ostensibly, it was a shelter, but really, you know, these kids were incarcerated um, in a former Walmart. Um, it was 250,000 square feet. Um, Kids were held inside for 22 hours a day, 23 hours a day on the weekdays. Um, it was, uh, 
I still don't really know how to wrap my head around what I saw at the time. And um, I, uh, a very long story short, I, I, I should have known, I should have seen this coming. And the reason I wanted to write the book is that frankly, I didn't. I ended up in the middle of this as a correspondent for MSNBC and NBC News and became associated with covering this policy because I was there and was invited to be there by the administration. Um, but really, I kind of missed the whole lead up to it, really. And, and you know, I thought that I was, um, I thought I knew what I was talking about. I was covering border issues. I was covering, you know, does Trump, is he right about the need to build a wall? Is MS-13 really flooding across the border? Are drugs coming through ports of entry? Or are they going in between the walled areas? You know, I, I was kind of cocksure, frankly, about fact checking the administration when really the whole time folks like yourself um, could if not see this specific policy coming, understand how Donald Trump was able to do that, just like that, turn on this mm -hmm. heinous policy um, that will traumatize these children for life at this point, um, because the system was set up to do so. And, and that's what this journey really was for me. And it's a journey that I wanted to explain in the book, um, because I think a lot of people out there are less like you and more like me, they missed it. Um, mm -hmm. And they said to themselves, how could this happen in the United States of America? How could it happen in our name? Um, and how could it happen on our, our watch? You know, even though there was such a great so-called resistance to Donald Trump. Um, mm -hmm. And so it was more than anything, it was a reckoning for me. Um, and I hope ultimately it becomes, um, it becomes a, a reckoning for the people who were in the same boat that I was. And I think that there's a lot, unfortunately, a lot more people who kind of saw it through my eyes than saw it through yours. And, and I wish that wasn't the case, you know, now, mm -hmm. today, looking back. I think you just set yourself a little short in the sense that the book is incredibly important. And it's important because it tells the story of what you, you know, say this egregious human rights violation, torture. Um, and yeah, I think often the advocates, we always look forward, you know, you like, you look to the next thing because it's always like an avalanche of stuff and we don't do enough of reckoning with what has just come. So I think, you know, it's an incredible contribution just for that alone. Um, Thank you. I should, I should also say, um, I didn't myself see it immediately. You know, I heard about it really soon um, because my colleagues who are literally working on the border had seen it. Um, I'm not actually one of the lawyers on the Mizell case, but not too long after in the summer of 2018, we started seeing people, parents, who had been separated from their children in Victorville. It's actually one of the things you talk about in the book. Right. Um, and we actually represented IMDEF. So when Lindsay Toslowski managed to get in finally, you know, that was because of our litigation to get them in. So my kind of interaction with this was talking to the fathers actually um, of children who had been separated. And of course they had been separated from their children in Victorville, which, I think didn't happen until June or July. Right. Of course, we had we had filed Ms. L in February, you know, before then. Um, but anyway, you know, we could talk about many things. Let me pick up on a couple of different things. Well, well actually, you, you go ahead. Can I just add you yeah. quickly, Island, yeah. because, you know, by the way, you probably spoke with the father that goes by Juan in the book. It's a pseudonym that, he, you know, he asked um, and his son to be the yeah. Jose because of the their, their safety and the safety of their family. But I mean, yeah, I, you and I had never met before. We talked on the phone a couple of weeks ago before I had to reschedule this because of the news of the Irwin Detention Center. But to talk to you about it almost gave me the chills because what I was learning about, you were on the other side of. And you, um, when I said intimidating earlier as I was choking to death, um, it, to me, the reason it's so intimidating is that um, I'm learning about these things and I'm trying to be transparent about learning about them. And these are things that you could probably recite in your sleep. And I, I wonder, um, what did I get wrong? I mean, you read the book, you saw the book. Um, uh, where, um, forget about things that I got right, but but in the paperback, what do I need to change? Um, okay, I'll answer that question. <laughs> we talked about this a bit before, um, but I do want to talk about things that you got right that are really important for our audience. Yeah. And I would say like 98% of the book or something is spot on exactly right. I was a C <laughs> student, so that's a pretty good grade. To <laughs> and the one, the one thing I would say is, and we talked about this earlier, the, the zero tolerance policy is what the Trump administration says now 
Um, and even then they said, like, this is why we're doing family separation. And what they meant by that was like, people are unlawfully crossing the border and they're being charged with a crime. We have now decided we're going to we're going to charge every single person who crosses the border unlawfully. And um, even though we've shut the border itself and made it really hard, really long lines to, you know, apply for asylum. And so then, you know, just like somebody gets arrested for DUI or whatever, you know, if there's a child there and we're going to take them to jail, that's that, you know, and that's why this is happening. And I think in our messaging also, and a lot of the public messaging, people have said, that's crazy. You know, you shouldn't be prosecuting people who are crossing the border if they're really fleeing persecution. It is crazy to do that and then separate them from their children. But there's actually a different problem, which is that they did this to people who did not cross the border illegally. And Ms. L herself presented at the border. She broke no law whatsoever. It's true that she didn't have a valid document, but she came to the border and said she wanted to apply for asylum. And so did hundreds of other people. That is not a crime. And you're allowed, the law allows you to apply for asylum. And they took her child anyway. That's right. And this happened before zero tolerance started. February, right? February of 2018. Right. right. So the reason why I think this sort of matters, it's it kind of doesn't matter because I think like this is a horrific human rights violation and torture, regardless of which way you came into the country or presented yourself at the border, right? But there's this certain segment of the society who hears this, hears their excuse, and is like, yeah. It is, you know, it's it's really hard that we have to enforce our immigration laws, but, you know, they're the laws. And if the government wants to employ, you know, to a, a harsh way of enforcing the law, that's okay. And that actually really undersells the horror of what they did because they first decided to take people's children away. They decided to do it across the board. And as you document in the book, they wanted to do it to like literally everybody, everybody. coming into the border. And then they manufactured this excuse, hoping it would make it go away. Right. And then it and then it didn't make it go away. You know. So that's the one sort of thing, you know, that we talked about, you know, earlier. And this concept of, you know, crossing the border is uh, without papers is a crime. I think there's, you know, we've always said you shouldn't be prosecuting people for that if they are asylum seekers. But the law itself, black letter, does not contain that exception already. Um, so in contrast, though, being inadmissible or what they say you know coming to the border without a document but saying right. you want to apply for them that is not a crime right. um, and so that's the one kind of thing that you know um, I, and I think I think I appreciate you know the distinction and I think it is so important because in retrospect what I learned even subsequent to the book coming out I had sources call me after the book came out and told me this crazy story about how um, there was this meeting in the White House Situation Room where in May of 2018, before they moved forward with zero tolerance, that the, sort of the watered down version of family separations that ultimately, it's sort of sick to call it watered down, frankly, because right. you have 54 or 5,500 kids who are permanently, you know, traumatized, tortured. Um, but that's the reality. That is the, that is the sort of 2.0 version of what they had wanted to do. The first version was known as administrative separation. So anyway, the story goes, they're all sitting in the White House Situation Room and Stephen Miller forces a show of hands vote about are we, it basically said, pardon my language, like, fuck it, are we moving forward or not? We've been trying to do this for so long. Um, it's un-American uh, not to move forward with this thing. And for him, it was a battle between going with the DOJ version and doing, separating everybody, not even involving the Department of Justice in this from the get-go, just like you said. So Miss L would have been basically the prototype case. Right. And in in the Miss L, um, in the Miss, at least when Miss L was originally detained, they had said it was because there were no proof that that was her daughter, if I'm not mistaken, um, who they later sent to Chicago. Um, and after this got into the press and there was a DNA test, you know, they they reunited them, um, probably to try to make this go away. And you know this better than I do uh, yeah, from the legal thing. perspective. Um, and I, I guess I didn't, frankly, I didn't realize even until after the book came out, how bad this really could have become. So like separations during zero tolerance, before, during, and after, let's say as of today, 5,500 kids approximately have been separated. Stephen Miller wanted to separate upwards of 100,000 just through right. the end of 2018. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wish actually, after having talked with you about this and learned what I learned after the book came out, and, and in all seriousness, maybe in the paperback, that is a, a, a place to go with this. 
it could it could have been so so much worse. Again, one child is too many, but it could have been so much worse than than I was ever able to conceptualize in in doing the work. You know, right. Yeah, and I think this raises sort of two other points which are important in the book. You do talk about, um, in fact, I marked it, it's on page 308. Um, <laughs> you know, why did they do this? You know, is it just that they're horrific human beings? And I think they are, you, know, you paint that uh, with a sort of startling clarity. Um, but also I think they have this basic political objective which you talk about in the book, which is we'll create a massive crisis, yes. just separate these thousands of people and then we'll force people to come to the table and have a discussion about immigration. And then we'll end this in return for, and then they had this like, you know, wish list of things, everything from like, end the Flores agreement, rewrite the TVPRA so that we can just kick children things out. they're doing today. Yeah, what they're do, exactly. Work. Yeah, exactly what they're doing under the CDC ban, which I see in the comments here, someone asking about that. You know, they wanted to do family separation to do that and also decrease legal immigration. Do you remember what the election, the, um, uh, executive order was called affording Congress the opportunity to something like change immigration yeah. rights. And, and instead of let's end this heinous policy that was the quote unquote Democrats law, which was the cover for the policy, you know, in the press, um, I guess, I guess the thing to me is like, they were always really with me transparent about what they wanted to do. They wanted to end, they wanted to get around this trafficking law, TVPRA, uh, mm -hmm. to be able to immediately send kids back, expel Central American kids and other kids from non-contiguous countries mm -hmm. back to their home countries. And they wanted to indefinitely detain families, um, just like the Obama administration wanted to do, by the way. I mean, and I'm sure we'll get into all of that, but it's like these have been underlying goals of the deterrence-based, punitive-based sort of immigration um, enforcement system for, for Democratic and Republican administrations. And it right. was only Trump that supersized it to this place where, and I mean, another, ex sorry to keep coming back to you to ask, but like uh -huh. another example is ending temporary protected status for people from El Salvador or Haiti, other countries. And and that's a case actually where, that 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 you are litigating. And on the surface, it looks like you were dealt um, a, a, a recent blow, but can you just update us on, I mean, that's another one where it's like, this administ th these are the types of things that the administration did in this supersized way that you would have never seen before. So where are we with, with TPS? And then we'll come back to all this stuff. Yeah, I, I think that's also part of the idea, create a massive untenable crisis. Exactly. Um, play political football with people's lives. Um, and in the TPS case, TPS for people who don't know, it's a, a statute that Congress passed in 1990 that said that people who are here already from countries that are having some kind of humanitarian crisis, could be civil war, could be environmental, any number of things can stay here until the country is safe to accept back its nationals. And there's a process where people in the DHS are supposed to do these objective country conditions reports. And then if they conclude that the country is still unsafe, then you extend TPS. And there's people from six countries who've had it for, um, in some cases, as much as 20 years. And there's about 400,000 of them and they've been here for all this time lawfully and working. So it also Some of them created for the majority now, of their lives, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Tons of them who came here at a young age or whatever, and now they have like teenage kids in high school. You know, and so this also creates a separate humanitarian problem. You know, like it's one thing, even if Haiti, you know, were safe to go back to, or Sudan, which has an ongoing civil war, or El Salvador. I think it's a fair question. Like, really, we're going to send these people back? when their kids are in like junior high and stuff? Is that really what we're gonna do? But there's also the just the objective issue, like somebody has to decide that these countries are safe to take these people back or else, you know, the TPS statute says that they get to keep it. And when the Trump administration came to power, they wanted to end TPS, literally end TPS. That's what they said. It was the agenda of Center for Immigration Studies and Federation for American Immigration Reform. You these mean, right -wing. by the way, just kick out hundreds of thousands of people from the country. Right. Yeah. 400,000 people strip their immigration status. It would be the largest, from what we can tell, the largest single stroke D uh, designation of people's lawful status in American history, from what we can tell. And then they did it. They had to cook the books to really rig the country conditions reports because there is a civil war in Sudan. There is all these, pro you know, but they did it anyway. And so at the end of this happened at the end of um, 2018. And so we, excuse me, the end of 2017 and the beginning of 2018. And so we sued over that and we got an injunction stopping 
all the terminations. And then the government appealed. And yeah, just a couple of weeks ago, a 2 one Ninth Circuit decision reversed our win. And so now we're in the either we can try and seek review from all the, the Ninth Circuit, what they call on bank or Supreme Court review of the decision that you know said this was lawful. So that's where that is. And, and I guess um, my, my question about it specifically is what happens, <clears throat> we're talking about 400,000 people, um, what's, is this, is this the end at this point? Or you said you have an on bank, uh, yeah, not the end. Uh, yeah, the two what happens? Are they, and, and what about if Biden wins? I mean, is that going to change things? Yeah. So under the agreement that we set up to implement the injunction, even if we lose now and, there, and lose any further appeal, the soonest TPS could terminate would be March 5th. Um, for actually all the countries other than El Salvador and for El Salvador, it's November 5th, 2021. So Biden so reverse it. If he <laughs> exactly. And he said when the decision came down, his camp immediately made a statement, we would re-review all of these. Um, so this is yet another thing that is riding on the election. Um, I want to say something else about this, because this is something I love about the book. You know, you say early on you're you're investigating the story about these call centers in Mexico and these yeah. uh, American kids who have or or people who who've lived their whole lives here and ended up there. And it um, TPS is exactly like this, right? Like our lead plaintiff in the TPS case is a 16 now she's 16 year old, I believe, American teenage girl from the Bay Area who's like a soccer player. You know, she's as American as any. I mean, she's American. She's born in the United States. And she would literally either have to be separated from her parents exactly. or go, go back, back to El Salvador. Um, and it kind of, you talk about this with these call centers and you're visiting these completely American sounding people who are working in these places. And this is what you said, um, you know, goes to sort of family separation from before. Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm glad that you brought that up. I haven't actually talked about this in sort of any of these book events, but for me, that was the idea for me of what family separation was. I, I had seen it a couple times as a reporter um, and this was during the end of the Obama administration. Um, I had seen, obviously, by the way, President Obama, we should say, deported more people than anyone um, in history, which is why he got this nickname, Deporter in Chief, oh, from, yeah, from the immigration activist community. Um, and it, this bizarre industry has, has, has popped up in places like Tijuana, um, which is call centers for, for either deported um, Mexican nationals who, or, or, or nationals of any country, I guess, that, but that are, you know, kicked into Mexico, um, who have lived in America their whole lives and, and colloquially, you know, speak perfect colloquial English, because why wouldn't they, that they grew up here, um, or um, a family members of people who decide to pick up and leave and go back. And there are school, full schools of children who have followed their deported parents back as well. And those are two places that I've been seen and reported on to sort of understand the reality of what deportation, what does it really mean? What does it do? And for me, that was what I thought family separation was. You either have to make the choice to stay here without your parent who gets deported for one reason or another, or family member, um, uh, or, or go and find this new life in a place you never have known ever before and find these odd, jobs like working in a car, call center for an American auto parts company in Tijuana because the labor is cheap. These are ostensibly Amer either literally or ostensibly Americans. Um, and it's that's the type of 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 separation that I thought. Right. So mm -hmm. I never in my mind, I never, ever uh, would have thought. And I, by the way, there are many reporters who did. Julia Ainsley, who's now my colleague, but was at Reuters, Caitlin Dickerson uh, from The New York Times. Uh oh, I think we lost your. Uh, Signal Island, but I'll keep going. Um, I, Lomi, I think we just lost me? your video. Yeah, we lost your video. Okay. Um, Lomi Creel from the Houston Chronicle. Maybe I just don't see you. Does anybody else see you? Let's see. Looks like someone sees me. Well, maybe just my connection doesn't see you. Do you guys can, see me okay? I can both hear and see you fine. So. Oh, great. Okay, good. So you'll come back soon. Um, so there were journalists who, who did see this stuff. Um, before I did, and I didn't, and so that was, I guess, long story again. Long story short, that was my understanding of what family separation was, and I never would have anticipated that it would become, um, become what Donald Trump decided to do. It, and by the way, either did officials in the Obama administration who considered it and rejected it out of hand. Right. Yeah, and I think this is one of the tricky things for us when we talk about this because, I mean, I definitely believe there's a difference between, you know, saying, oh. 
excuse me for a minute, mommy has to go to the bathroom and then, you know, you never see your mom for months. Um, and I remember yes. in the summer of 2018, I know you have young kids, I have a young kid. It was tough to talk to these people. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just so horrific, you know? Um, I mean, that's not the same as what Krista Ramos faces in the TPS case. Um, it's, yeah, it's different, <laughs> but you know, it, it's kind of, a, a gradient thing, right? Like I remember the worksite raids from uh, the Bush administration, to, you know, not too long after I first came to the ACLU in SoCal. Then they arrest you at a worksite. You could be deported the next day or that night. Nobody comes to pick up the kids from school. You know, like that, it's not quite the same as what happened to Ms. L, but it's also not the same as Rama. I mean, and it just shows you, you have this continuum of real cruelty built into our system that I think it's it, it's been useful in a way to talk about family separation to say like, hey, this is separation too. It's not the same, but it's also really awful. It's what I learned um, sort of looking back, you know, retrospectively at this, um, that, that this family separation was, let me put it this way. It was easy, I think, for people to stand up and oppose this because of um, Donald Trump, frankly. Um, mm -hmm. But to me, that's unfortunate um, because this was, that's why I called the book Separated Inside an American Tragedy, um, mm -hmm. not Donald Trump's tragedy. Mm -hmm. um, because we, we weren't, this didn't happen just because of Donald Trump. This happened because of um, Bill Clinton, prevention through deterrence in 1994. This happened because of George Bush creating DHS and exploding the size of the Border Patrol. It happened because of Obama deporting more people than ever before. And it happened because of Obama and Biden building the facilities with the cages that the kids I saw locked up in. Um, and um, again, what Trump did was uniquely reprehensible, um, uniquely a violation of according to the ruling of Judge Sabra, shocked the conscience, right? When he said that they have to be reunited. What he did to the children was um, was definitely unprecedented. Um, but it what but but again, where I have learned it, the feelings that the separated families went through, which was its own unique set of experiences, was not completely foreign to people who had been caught up in the American immigration system in some other place at some other time before. Right. Right. So I wanted to talk about a couple of things before we start taking questions. Sure. Um, one of the things that you um, sort of prefigure in the very beginning of the book is maybe some of the reason these people are talking to you is that it turned out that the whole world thought this was one of the most atrocious things yes. anybody had ever seen. And a lot of people were involved in it because you can't separate 5,000 children without having a lot of people in the government doing different things. And so, you know, all kinds of people are are now talking to you about their role in it uh, with obviously some agenda, inevitably. And I think it raised a question about a, a really important question for academics, for um, people in, in media, people in government, people all over about what we do with these people. And I actually think this is really important regardless of whether Trump wins the election. I mean, people like Kirsten Nielsen, who actually, I didn't know her, but she was my classmate at Georgetown, as it turned oh, out. Wow. Um, you know, they're now out of government. I mean, a ton of the people who, in your book are, are out of government now, even though they're involved in it. And so, you know, they could be hired and to do any number of things. Um, Ivanka Trump, you clearly talked to somebody close to her or whoever, you know, I'm not... No Don't comment. To ask you. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> um, you know, there's White, there's McNulty, all these people saying like, oh, well, you know, I was so worried about this that I wanted to fix the database problem. Or, you know, I expressed real concerns about this, but it turns out like with White, he'll resign over the abortion um, policy in ORR, which we sued over, but didn't apparently resign over this. So I guess I, I'm curious about you, like, how do you deal with this as a journalist, right? Like, you know, you, you have these people talking to you, they have their kind of incentives. You're telling their story. Like, what do you what do you think about? How well, do you deal I, look, with that? I look at it through the same lens of me telling the story, right? Um, I don't, as a journalist, I don't believe in objectivity, right? Everybody comes to things with their own subjective point of view, set of lived experiences, how they approach something. And for me, my story is one of literally 54, 5,500 in the telling of this story. 
those people come to the, those people come to these conversations with their own set of experiences that are obvious and transparent. So the idea they'd be coming with their own, um, uh, and I'm not gonna say who I talked to, but their own unfiltered, um, honest version of the truth. I, I I don't believe from from day one. And do I think there were a lot of, as they say in my business, CYA cover your ass interviews um, that people wanted to do for the book? There's no doubt about it. I mean, but I don't think to me that wasn't a surprise. Um, the reason I wrote that little piece in the book about how, you know, undoubtedly people came to me with their own agendas and their own um, um, sort of mission in setting the record straight um, is because I don't think they, I, I'm not sure any of those, I'm not sure any of the people in this book wouldn't say the same thing, to be honest. They want their version of events uh, to come out to the world, which is why I didn't base the book on uh, one person. You know, it's mm -hmm. why you do get the story of, um, Commander Jonathan White, who was the right. exactly was the the lead person on the reunifications for HHS. Why you hear a lot about Nielsen, um, you hear a lot about McAleen, and uh, you know you hear about the father and son Juan and Jose. You hear about Lindsay, the immigration attorney who was on the front line, um, and that's the other thing. It's like you know only in doing that and sort of synthesizing. That's why I wrote the book chronologically. By the way, also I had my own experiences over the course of specifically that one week in June. But then beyond, as I continue to track this stuff, I didn't know what, yeah, I'm embarrassed to say I didn't know what Pacer was before I, uh, <laughs> I started working on this. And that's the sort of federal courts online system of, for people that don't know, looking up documents and stuff. Um, but I figured, you know, once I start talking to people, everyone else will have their own chronological version of events. And once I overlay them with each other, um, I hope it will paint a picture where you don't see everything in isolation, but you can see the interconnectedness of it and where stories add up and where they don't. Um, and so, in that regard, I kind of had fun because it was hearing a lot, a lot of, of fun is the wrong word, but I had, it was interesting to me as a journalist and exciting to put these different versions of the same story together because it became very apparent to me where people weren't telling the truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that about the book that it's like you show all these different perspectives. And I think with something like this, where the history is contested the moment that thing happens, it's so important that you portray it that way. Um, Thanks. So I got one last question for you, and sure. then I feel like we should probably take some questions. Okay. Um, it's this thing we talked about, the El Paso pilot thing. And yes. I think it's really interesting because this is not the only Trump administration policy that seems to like pop up somewhere. You know, you've got, I mean, there's so many things you could, you could point to. The Border Patrol ending up in Portland, this Irwin, um, what's going on with these hysterectomies or apparently um, involuntary medical procedures. Yes. Um, I mean, there's there's a million of them. You could talk about like this. The way you tell the story, suddenly the El Paso sector is doing family separations, and nobody from the central or the federal government, like high ups, have told them to do it. And given that it was just rejected by the Obama administration very explicitly, it's like just really weird. Like somebody, some mid level person in El Paso was like, oh, this sounds like a good idea. Let's try this. Can you say a little bit about that? Sure. What I think, and just to back up. So basically, in the summer of 2017, the Border Patrol started this pilot program where they separated the initial um, batch of, I think, 700 or so children before zero tolerance began. Maybe it ended up being more, but Caitlin Dickerson in the New York Times reported uh, in April of 2018 it had been 700 through then. Um, and in my book, and to this day, I still don't know who's responsible for starting that pilot program, but um, everybody that you talk to at headquarters will deny that um, that they were aware of it. And um, it, it's frankly been really hard to pin down. Inspectors general have not been able to pin it down. And th this thing has been investigated by the Department of Homeland Security, of, of HHS, of CRCL, Civil Rights and Civil Liberties within, um, within DHS. Um, and I was litigated too. Um, but we we still don't know and I, my personal sort of theory on it is that it would be impossible for this to come up uh with john kelly in march of 2017 him talk about wanting to do it on cnn knowing at this point that stephen miller wanted to do so-called administrative separations and literally separate every parent and child that crossed the border um together and then all of a sudden aaron hall the sector chief in el paso decides to start referring children i'm uh, sorry parents of children to the u.s attorney in the western district of texas it just it's just too perfect you know yeah. um so i do think that um that is one of the big sort of mysteries that 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 it's sort of sitting out there as like this seems so obvious that somebody had to be involved 
but we truly, as a journalist, you know, I can't say for sure, and it'd be irresponsible for me to say, but there are certainly, um, it, it strikes me as very, very strange that we don't know more. And I mean, there are documents, there was an after action report from the border patrol that cited an inspector general report that still hasn't come out. Mm -hmm. I frankly haven't been able to get my hands on it and nobody else has because they haven't published it. Um, so I think one day we'll know the answer to that. And I actually think it'll shed a lot more light on how ultimately we got to, um, to, the, to the zero tolerance policy that we all came to know. Right. Yeah, well, I, I think, um, not that you need more encouragement, but yeah. I feel like that's incredibly important from a historical perspective too. You know, just as important as what is in the book is resolving that unanswered question. One thing we learned in the TPS litigation only through massive discovery and going through like thousands of documents was that people right from Stephen Miller and his office had to get country conditions reports to say that it was a good idea to send like 200,000 people back to El Salvador who've lived here lawfully for 20 years. And that's not an easy thing to do. And these people are calling down into the agency yes. and, and talking. And in some cases they have like people who came out of their, you know, anti-immigrant white supremacist kind of background who have ended up t taking jobs and they put them in jobs in the agency. And then they're getting those people to do stuff. And people have reported on this really well in the TPS context. It's got to be something like that that must have happened. I was uh, a, I was an election reform advocate before I was a journalist. And when we would talk about voter ID, we'd call it a solution in search of a problem. And it's exactly um, e exactly what I saw happen in, in separations. It sounds like what happened in the TPS case. And, and, there, and there has to be, I mean, it, it, it's not there has to be, there obviously is more there. I mean, there are just, the pieces don't all add up yet. And and one day they will. Um, and I think that, you know, when it comes, I mean, the big question that I'm asked often is like, who's to blame? And are there gonna be consequences for any of these people for doing this yeah. stuff? And I don't think we can answer that question fully until we know what happened in El Paso. Right, and I, and I think just as there was all this calls from the human rights, and this is to answer Roger's question, which is here on the side. Yeah. You know, there were all these calls for accountability on torture after um, rendition um, and Guantanamo and all those things. You know, it's unfortunate it didn't end up being what it should have been. The same is true here, you know, whether it's this after this election or the next one or whatever, like this is incredibly important. Somebody has to be held accountable for the torture that was committed on these children and their parents. Especially, and, and then we'll go to the questions, but especially if this was what it appeared to be, which they first admitted publicly, but then sort of backed off on a deterrence policy, doing this just mm -hmm. for the purpose of scaring people away from coming here and not as the stated intention was to stop lawbreakers from coming into the country. And to me, the idea of administrative separations is a pretty big smoking gun that they debated separating 100,000 people or more instead of just the ones who cross in between ports of entry, quote unquote, illegally, even though they were asylum seekers, most of them. Um, you know, so those those pieces will one day add up. Um, and uh, and I, I've, I've become obsessed with it at this point. And just like I do check Pacer every day to find out how many people legal aren't was reporting, uh, were separated or reunited. It's like, you know, these are the kinds of things I keep going back to. And I think one day we'll have an answer. So do you want to just open the questions and should we just sure. pick and choose them? Yeah. Anything that you've seen that's come through that. So the first one, I have a few thoughts on, but I'm curious to know your, this one has sure. the most votes, I guess. Um, oh, wait, now they, well, anyway, yeah. Um, oh, can you sort process, of check that out? Yeah, mine is, due process for those in detention at the southern border, immigration reform is still in the distance. Do you see a way to possibly catch up with the backlog of cases, even if a change in administration desires it? And I have a thought on that. I don't know if you... So due process for those in detention at the southern border, this fly knows that my dinner's in my room. Um, due process for those in detention at the southern border, immigration reform is still in the distance. You see any way of catching up with the backlog? I think you could probably answer that question better than I can. I mean, the backlog is incredibly enormous at this point. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the main thing which uh, people who are want to do something good in the immigration space see is, you know, that backlog is filled with million, or I guess thousands, hundreds of thousands of cases of people who have lived here for years, years long, right? I mean, who have years. no criminal history, who um, in many cases lived here lawfully, 
even if they have a criminal history, the convictions might be very old, people who have American children, you know, so many other, that if you if you took seriously an administrative relief mechanism, something vaguely like what was called DAPA, what the, what the second thing the Biden, I mean, the Obama administration tried to do that got stopped in the courts, um, and just cleared out all the cases of people that we didn't want to, dep- you know, deport or, or enforce against, um, you know, it would just look very, very different and you'd clear a huge amount of the, the, the backlog that way. Um, so that's sort of my thought about it. And I know that's something that at least some people in the Biden team, if they were so lucky as to be able to decide some of this, have thought about. Yeah. You know, can I ask you about that, about Biden in particular? I mean, there have been, I think, in from sort of the your world, um, I have heard rumblings that people are very nervous about what the Biden administration um, is going to mean for 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 immigrants, um, both undocumented and those who are going to be coming to the country. Um, and for instance, they haven't said what they're going to do about TVPRA or Forest Settlement Agreement, both of the things that they fought that the Trump administration fought and that led to family separations because they wanted to overturn those things. I mean, are you are you worried that kind of a Biden administration, like I'm hearing from other people, would basically have a lot of the same underlying goals without sort of the resistance to them? Yeah, that is exactly what I'm worried about. And I think there's something really great in the book and that you've alluded to here too. Family detention camps, uh, well, I mean, they were there under Bush briefly, and then they were stopped, we sued them, and then they re-arose in 2014. Um, and Obama was caging children, you know, and it was a striking thing, like Michelle Obama is there being like children in cages, but her husband did that. She said it during, I cringed when I heard her say it at the Democratic convention, talking about the cages, the literal cages that I saw with my own eyes were built by her husband. and. It's, it's really uncomfortable to talk about because people who are vehemently opposed to what they saw through reporting that I did and other people who, again, were at the, on the story before I was, um, they don't like to hear that. But yeah. but it's the truth. And my worry is, as a journalist, sort of the, the consumer of these types of stories is going to go away. Um, and not really care about this like they have over the course of the last three and a half. Yeah, I mean, another thing sort of along the same lines, you talked about how Obama deported more people than, that's more than Trump as well. Yep. And, uh, you know, in his first four years, he will exceed, (laughs) sorry, Obama's first four is more than the uh, four years that Trump is finishing now. The main reason for that is it's not that Trump didn't want to. No, these containers, right? Yeah, exactly. The sanctuary legislation that we had fought for for years to try and get passed in California and elsewhere and could not get it done. We got like micro steps. But then like 2016, boom, just like that, a bunch of blue states, sanctuary legislation and deportations drop. Um, And I have... I have a real worry about that. Like, I hope everybody who's really upset about family separation and kids in cages and all that in there is just as upset, you know, later. One thing I have also heard not, um, I've not heard anything about the Biden administration, potential Biden administration say, is about the MPP policy, you know, the policy which has said, you can apply for asylum, but you have to do it while you're waiting in a refugee camp in Mexico. And now there's tens of thousands of people living in these internal displaced people camps. Like, in theory, supposed to be prepared asylum, for the immigration, know it, right? Yeah, exactly. Sorry? I was just going to say, asylum as we knew it is it no longer Gone. exists. Yeah, yeah. Hey, about and, the, about the well, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, like they haven't said whether they will end that. Uh, you know, they said, for example, they'll review all the TPS decisions, which is great. Clearly, they have in mind that they would want to try and uh, bring DACA back in its full force. But will they get rid of the MPP program? Will they end family detention? Unclear. It, and and you know you mentioned I'm just opening this door so these flies can go away. Go go outside, flies. Go back to your family, as I tell my son. Um, I should have thought about that earlier. So oh no, with the jails, you know that's another example of kind of this myopic look at what immigration policy is. Like it's Donald Trump's immigration policy. Um, the the irony is in so so called sanctuary cities today these are the cities that were cooperating with the obama administration to hand over um to ice people who had um served their time uh, gave back their debt to society um oftentimes nonviolent you know criminals uh criminals who were who were then uh, turned over and deported 
And only during the Trump administration did sort of these cities, LA County is the best example. They've just kicked ICE out of the jail. I was just in LA County yeah. jail with the sheriff. They just kicked ICE out of the jail entirely. They used to have an office. ICE had an office inside the jail where they would just literally, it was like, um, it's a, they were picking people out out of a lineup, basically. As they yeah, they literally inter I mean, we did this a lot of work on this. You know, they they would literally choose the people to interview based on objective neutral criteria. <laughs> Sometimes they claim it's foreign birth, but there's clearly an opportunity for race discrimination here. Um, and yeah, thousands and thousands of people got deported that way, including people who were arrested but were never convicted of any crime. It's what allowed Obama to become the deporter in chief. I mean, that's yep. where the main volume, there's no way, even if Donald Trump wanted to become the deporter in chief without using detainers from county jails and, and other places like that, I don't think that physically he would be able to do it. There isn't a so-called deportation force like he promised he would create. Um, big, and I hate to say that because then he'd probably try to do it, but like, uh, but literally mm -hmm. logistics are impossible. Exactly, not big enough to recreate what you can do from the thousands and thousands and thousands of local law enforcement agencies all around the country, right? Or cooperating with 287G or secure communities or whatever, exactly. whatever or what was going on back then. Yeah. These are so all things I've learned. But yeah, go ahead. Well, um, well, if you don't mind, if I move on from just that, Please. there's a question here which relates to I know you were on the ground recently in Georgia. Yep. Could you please give us an update on the sterilization of uh, women? And I'm curious to know if you, I don't know very much, I'm hearing from advocates in you know, a sort of secondhand, but if you know anything more about that. Yeah, and just to be clear, I, I reported on it actually from here, but I interviewed Don Wooten actually from this room, which is my little laundry room in my house, the washer and dryer right back there. <laughs> um, uh, I spoke to her, she's the a very courageous whistleblower who spoke out and what's really a very complicated um, story. You know, I think that um, initially she had spoken out because of conditions relating to coronavirus. Like we've seen, I've talked to detainees and employees in Eloy and La Palma, two ICE detention centers in Arizona where things are out of control. They described it as a war zone. Um, employees were dying, but that's being repeated all across the country. And it's why, by the way, Judge Dolly G ordered the release of children from the family detention centers, which the Trump administration has refused to do with their entire family altogether, even though they could do it. Um, she, want, she was speaking out about coronavirus and, the, and this issue of hysterectomies was almost, I don't want to say hearsay, but it was not something that had a lot of depth and evidence behind in her whistleblower complaint. Um, the day or the day after she spoke out, um, the, the Intercept first reported this, but I spoke with her um, about this. And then we started talking to attorneys that were representing women who were there. And I think the New York Times so far has really written kind of the, the, the most definitive piece in terms of talking to women. And talk, uh, Tina Vasquez also from PRISM has done an extraordinary job talking to women, talking to um, employee, uh, employees, talking to the attorneys. And what it sounds like more than anything, although there's a lot of investigation that still needs, this is the kind of story if to peel back the curtain on my business that we would spend months on investigating before you'd ever put anything out. But because of the whistleblower complaint, it kind of mm. blew out into the open. And a lot of this stuff was unverified. And unfortunately, because of the internet and really the hysteric Trump derangement syndrome, I really think it's a real thing. People hate Trump so much that when you hear about hysterectomies of women in ICE, all of a sudden it becomes mass hysterectomies all throughout ICE. Stephen Miller, you know, um, trying to uh, organize genocide in ICE detention. That's not what this appears to be. What it appears to be is a system with a horrific history of poor oversight of medical treatment of detainees in ICE, in prisons for people who are there only because of their immigration status oftentimes. Um, and women who were undergoing procedures with this one doctor, Dr. Amin, without informed consent, uh, sometimes without translators, um, not understanding procedures, being diagnosed with something that, that medical records or their lawyers have said now at this point, or they have said um, that they didn't have. And so what I think needs to happen in this instance specifically, and this is the story that we that happened the night that we had to postpone the first time is that these investigations need to play out. So um, the IG at DHS is investigating, uh, journalists are investigating at this point. And whatever happened there is obviously very serious. I don't think it's, it's literally mass hysterectomies. I think hysterectomies happen and we talked to lawyers of women who said it happened to them, but it is, it seems to be widespread medical procedures without informed consent which is which is also horrific and 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 heinous, um, especially if this doctor was taking advantage for to make a to make a buck basically. Right, it, it sounds long. like it's sort of Medicare fraud ish kind of phenomenon, right? And this and doctor he had, been, had, had, he had settled. Yes, exactly. Say that again. 
he had settled previously with the federal government without admitting um, fault in a in a Medicare Medicaid fraud um, case to the tune of I think five hundred thousand dollars with other doctors. Right. Good. I, I appreciate your um, your telling us what you know about that. There's a question here about um, sort of ongoing reunification. Yes, that's and, a good question. And also, I think it's fair. I realize we haven't talked about that family separations are to some extent still going on and all that. Um, so why don't you say something about that, and then I will too. Sure. Your colleagues at ACLU say that you know at least a thousand have happened since um, the end of the zero tolerance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, and it may be more at this point. I, I actually haven't. That's why I got to check Pacer. I got to go on and see what the what the latest number is. Um, uh, but when it comes to reunifications, the the group that under the under the 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 relief ordered by Judge Sabra that hasn't been reunified yet is the group that was separated before zero tolerance began. And that's that's over a thousand um, parents and children. And the reason that's so complicated and frankly, I mean, just really hard to wrap your head around is that the government provided incorrect or incomplete information for all these families because the record keeping was so poor. So what's had to happen is literally the ACLU, um, Justice in Motion, Women's Refugee Commission, Kids in Need of Defense, Al Trilado have had to go literally door to door, or in some cases, um, you know, you obviously try to use the internet to track these people down. But because of COVID, a lot of this process has had to stop. So I think at this point today, and when you say track down, you mean like in Guatemala, right? Go. They call them a vice. My colleague now, Antonia Hilton, but who was at Vice before she was at NBC, did an amazing piece called "The Unreachables." These were parents that they literally couldn't find because the federal government decided, you know, it'd probably be better for the ACLU to find them or the NGOs to find them either because, I don't know why. I mean, you probably have a better insight into why, but they basically gave it over to, to, to NGOs to say, okay, you guys track it down if you really want to do it. And um, there's still over a thousand where they don't have reliable information and they can't find them. So it's not that they necessarily have been reunited. It's possible, but it's more, they don't know who they are. They don't know where they are. They don't know indeed if they actually were separated. And if they were separated, they're not sure if they've been reunited yet. Um, because of how hard it's, I got a flyer the other day from uh, the Women's Refugee Commission saying, can you please share this on the internet? Because literally at this point, that's how we have to do this during COVID. We cannot go to El Salvador and Honduras and Guatemala at this point to look for people because it's too dangerous. Right. And the other phenomena, which also I think has um, slowed since they essentially shut down the entire asylum system, uh, you know, using COVID as an excuse to do it. Um, but was really important, I think, before that, and I think is generally important, is that Judge Sabra's order in Mizell, the injunction that we won, Yes. It w what we argued was family separation should only occur where it would be okay to do it if this person was in the U.S. Like, the parent's a danger to the child. You know, if you can sh show abuse, or obviously, if you can actually show that this is parent is not the parent of the child and it's a smuggling situation, but he didn't do that. Uh, um, instead, he said essentially like there's a criminal history carve out, um, or like a, a safety carve out, so that if the government, in good faith, believes based on this history and like good faith after they've done this thing, it's just like um, you know then it's okay not just to put the parent with the child in family detention, because we never argued against family detention in the family separation case, right? right? But actually to separate them and put the parent in adults only immigration jail while they can it's go through the their ORR, yeah. process. Right, and the child goes as a now unaccompanied child into ORR. And although the number of separations has dramatically dropped, there's still, I mean, I was talking to um, Bardis Fakili, who's one of the lawyers who litigated it just a little bit before this, and he had said that there were like a, around a couple hundred of that original 5,000 who they still, the government um, argued under this exception, didn't have to reunify. And these include people with like DUI or really old conviction right. or they, person alleged they, to be um, a gang member or something. They, there was a, a, a really disturbing name for them. Um, it was the... Um, it wasn't inadmissibles. It was. Um, it'll come to me, but but they basically had a had a term that they had coined for the group of people who they wouldn't uh, ineligible. They were ineligible right. for reunification. Right. Um, and and the, I had like yeah. I mean two sort of response. I mean one thing is, and this is in the comments here. Like 
in a dependency proceeding in the U.S., you get due process. You know, if the government says you're abusing your child, you get to come and say, no, no, I'm not. And everybody gets a lawyer and there's like a whole. But the other thing is like, OK, if you have a DUI, that's bad. You shouldn't have done that. You know, even if you did some other whatever, it's bad. You should. We're going to permanently take away your child. I'm like, so glad that you like, said this. This, like, is, oh my this, God. Is, this is for me what the main reason that I wanted to include the story of Juan and Jose in my book instead of. Let me back up. The reason I wanted to include them is because Juan freely admitted to me that he came here twice before as an economic migrant. He illegally, illegally crossed, was undetected by the Border Patrol, um, made into the country, worked and would go home to Guatemala. But then when he faced persecution, when he, he and his son were threatened by narco uh, uh, narcos in his, uh, in his community in Patan, Guatemala, they decided to come to the United States. And to me, I don't care who this guy is, what he did. Um, what his priors were, it doesn't make it okay to uh, torture, in the words of Physicians for Human Rights, any human being when you're the United States government. And it was it reminded me of what actually the Reverend Al Sharpton, who's my colleague at MSNBC, said about George Floyd in his eulogy. He said, "George Floyd is the rejected stone who has become the cornerstone." And I'm not a I'm not I'm a Jewish boy from LA, so I don't, I'm not one for biblical uh, prophecy. But to me, that really resonated. To me, it's like. This is a story of so many people who you would have thought or could have been otherwise treated by people in this country as the other or the rejected stone. But if you look at what the government did, we should use all of them as the example for, for what our, how our government should not operate, what they should not do, regardless of, um, like you said, what their priors were, you know? Right. Yeah, that's so important, I think. And you see this in the policing context where... You know, the police shoot some unarmed black this man guy had a little weak or in the car or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then they're like, oh, but he had been convicted of this. I'm like, who cares? Does that right. mean you can just like shoot the guy? Like that right. just seems, yeah. And in this case, and in separations, it was always, you know, they it was they were all it was always something. This is a fraudulent family, or and by the way, sometimes that meant they came with auntie or uncle instead of father, uh, mother right. or father, and they would cite. I guess it's, it's part of the law that the definition of a family unit is really only your biological yeah. mother or father or your or your um, legal parent or guardian. And so yeah. they, were, they were, I mean, I bet you to this day, they're still taking away kids that come here with their extended family members um, yeah. be, because they say that they legally have to. I have to say that really hurt me, you know, because my family, my extended family, I was born here. My extended family is from Sri Lanka. And we had a lot of relatives get out of Sri Lanka in the 80s when the civil war happened because we're, you know, Tamils, we're an ethnic minority in Sri Lanka and the government was killing, you know, thousands of Tamils. And people couldn't always come with their parents. Right. You know, I had, we had cousins living in our house where their parents were like in Africa or, you know, whatever, like all kinds of stuff or for other reasons, even if they all came together, some had to you know, leave because their visas came through to go to England, but another one stayed because... You know, he was in school or whatever. And this idea that, uh, that you know, you, you can just treat these people as criminal because they're choosing not to come with their parents, it really hurt me. Really, really awful. And it's a justification that they still use to this day. Yeah, yeah. So I'm seeing in here, I think, unfortunately, we're out of time. I have to say, Jacob, I'd happily talk with you for another hour. I was going to say, we could do it. You know? We could go on Xbox or something and start a conversation. <laughs> do you, before we go... Is there anything you want to say sort of in closing about the book or anything? Else? Well, I, first of all, I just want to, I'm grateful to you and to Bromans um, for doing this. It's, this is, um, this has been a unique conversation about the book for me and one that I really, really was looking forward to and, and appreciate um, you taking the time. So really that's it. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really glad that we did this and, and like you, I could go on um, for a lot longer. So thanks Ailan, for doing this. And for mine, I'll just say thank you for writing it. You know, um, it's a really, really important part of the history of the last four years. It's incredibly important to tell the story. And like I said earlier, it sounds like you have a lot of other rich um, uh, kind of evidence to mine in this. And I hope you'll stay, you know, even as you do with lots of other great immigration reporting, which is it was just incredibly important also, I hope you'll stay with this too, because this is a story that has to be told, you know, from beginning to end. Thank you, and, and best of luck in all the ongoing litigation. I don't know how you do it. Yeah. 
Well, thank you, Jacob, and thank you, Ahilan, for uh, the wonderful talk. I know people in the chat are saying, please go on for longer, but <laughs> sorry, all good things must come to an end. Um, again, we do have signed copies of Separated available at our store. You can uh, get those by clicking on the green purchase button directly below the screen, and uh, just write a note saying that you would like a signed copy so that our store will know to send that to you. Freshly signed by me today. I was there earlier yeah, today. today. <laughs> also, um, if you would uh, like to re-watch this talk, the replay will be available within an hour or so. Just use the same link and you can share it with your friends who are unable to make it today. And um, I think that's about it. Our next virtual event is scheduled for tomorrow, October 2nd at 6 p.m. Pacific time with former NASA astronaut Terry Virts. And uh, have a good night, everyone, and stay safe. Bye, everybody. Thanks,